welcome. Um, I'm Catherine Wessinger, and I'm co-general editor of Nova Religio, the Journal of Alternative and Emergent Religions. And today, I'm very pleased to be speaking with Dr. Sabina Malyoko, professor of sociocultural anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. And she has interests in ritual, festival, and religion, folklore, expressive culture, magic, and witchcraft, modern pagan religions, and in addition to other topics. Dr. Malyoko, am I saying your name correct? Yes, I'll just perfect. ask you now. Okay, great. Beautiful. Okay, so Dr. Malyoko served as guest editor of the May 2020 issue of Nova Religio, focused on the topic of magic and politics. She wrote the introduction to the special issue as well as an article on witchcraft and political resistance. Welcome, Dr. Malyoko, and thank you for speaking with me today. It's very nice to be with you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Professor Weisinger. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, thanks. Um, first, let's discuss your introduction to the special issue, which is titled Magic and Politics, New Intersections in the United States. Why do you think the topic of magic and politics is important for the current time period? Right now, while we're, as we're speaking, it's May 2020 and the fourth year of President President Donald Trump's uh, presidency. So why is this topic um, of concern and important for the, for the current period? Well, one of the most surprising things to emerge from the 2016 US presidential election and the period following it is uh, the emergence of public practices of political magic, both on the right and on the left. Now, we usually think of magic as something that's completely separate from politics. Certainly in contemporary Western democracies, we don't think of people using magic to influence politics. But this emergence has shown how magic is just as important in a contemporary context as it was historically, because we know that historically people used magic to influence political outcomes. Uh, and just as important in the West as it continues to be in many non-Western post-colonial contexts, because we know that this happens in other parts of the world as well. So one of the things that I argue in my introduction is that the reason for the emergence of public magic after the election of Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States is that both sides felt a what I call a crisis of presence, borrowing the term from the Italian ethnologist Ernesto de Martino. A crisis of presence means a kind of lack of agency to bring about meaningful change, to alter things through traditional political means, such as voting and campaigning for candidates. And therefore that magic emerges from this crisis of presence. Thanks. And, um... There were two other articles, and we'll talk about your article in the, uh, in the issue in just a moment, but first let me ask you about the two other articles in the special issue. And um, Egel, Dr. Egel As Asprum, uh, he, his article is titled, The Magical Theory of Politics, Memes, Magic, and the Enchantment of Social Forces in the American Magic War, and the, Ma excuse me, the American Magic War. And Damon Berry's article is titled, Voting in the Kingdom, Prophecy Voters, the New Apostolic Reformation, and Christian Support for Trump. What do you think are the two, or what do you think are the most important conclusions drawn by these other two authors in the special issue? Well, Professor Asprem's article frames the discussion in this collection by examining the magical war between right and left wing witches, magicians, and esotericists ignited by the 2016 presidential campaign and the election that followed. And what he looks at is how the alt-right used memes to create a kind of online cult. Uh, and by cult, uh, I'm, I'm not using this word negatively or positively. I'm just talking about a group of people who are um, animated by what he calls uh, collective effervescence, focused on bringing about political disruption by electing Trump. After the election, left-wing magic workers responded by creating the magic resistance as a protest against the Trump administration. And so there you have a magical war. Predictably, this led to the creation of magical responses from the right against the magic resistance, uh, both the magical right and the religious right. 
So what Asprem does is he develops a theory of the use of magic in politics, and he argues that each movement generates a variety of phenomena that gain symbolic significance among their followers and reinforce the idea of a divine or supernatural cause that is driving events. These co create collective effervescence, a term that he borrows from Durkheim uh, among participants, and these shared symbols and shared significance then lead to a sense of common identity and can even constitute an emergent religion. So Asprem essentially argues that we can read both right and left wing political magic as new cultic or religiously based movements. Okay. Now Damon Barry's article looks in detail at one particular right wing uh, movement. He addresses the question of why some evangelical Christians have thrown their support behind Donald Trump, a figure who after all is not usually known for his faith or his adherence to Christian principles. But he explains, Barry explains how within the new apostolic reformation movement, a charismatic evangelical form of Protestant Christianity, uh, prophecies arose alleging that God had actually chosen Donald Trump to lead the United States as part of a divine plan to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. And that term, kingdom of God, uh, suggests a post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic, um, new kingdom in which the values of uh, evangelical Christians will prevail. So for the new apostolic reformation, Trump's character flaws are actually signs that he is God's chosen. Barry calls these voters prophecy voters. Uh, this denomination, the new apostolic reformation, participates in regular online prayer meetings to create what they call the POTUS shield, a shield of protection around the president to guard him against his enemies. Well, excuse me. Well, you've already touched on this, uh, but um, how do the topics of their articles intersect with the topic of your article, which is titled Witchcraft is Political Resistance? So politics aside, we can see that the techniques used by both right and left wing magic workers are actually very similar. Both are based on online communities. They make use of synchronous but distanced spells. Everybody's working at the same time, although they're separated geographically, uh, to bring about their desired results. And then as uh, Asprem indicates, these spells are actually made up of charged symbols that generate a sense of sacred meaning and heighten a feeling of belonging among practitioners. So these are community creating online and in some cases also offline um, techniques that are used across the board regardless of political affiliation. And so in your introduction, uh, what is your overall thesis? So my introduction is really a call to other scholars to pay attention to the intersections between magic and politics in the West. Magic is not some woo-woo, irrational, anti-modern praxis that we can only find in the third world or in post-colonial nations or in populations that lack access to education or resources. It's an important part of how contemporary people, and I would argue human beings, engage with the world around them. It's a form of expressive culture that can generate real political movements and thus bring about change in the real world, not necessarily through woo, but through people coming together and then working together towards a particular cause. It moves minds. It has a very long history as such in the West, uh, on both the right and the left. In fact, I argue against such thinkers as Umberto Eco, who saw all magic as essentially conservative, even fascist in essence, by demonstrating how magic is not anti-rational or anti-modern, but a part of the register of creative human expression, even in modernity. Okay. Well, and I just want to add that it's a fascinating issue of Novo Religio. I really enjoy um, all of the articles in it. And thank you very much for guest editing this special issue. It's been wonderful. Let's turn now to your article and the special issue titled Witchcraft as Political Resistance, Magical Responses to the 2016 Presidential Election in the United States. Please tell us about your article. 
My article is an ethnographic examination of the left-wing magic resistance as an artistic and aesthetic response to the election. I start by looking at the various online magical responses that emerged shortly after the 2016 election, especially after the inauguration in January 2017. Among them, Michael Hughes now famous, perhaps I should say infamous, spell to bind Trump and his allies. And I show how the spread of these responses beyond the community of magical practitioners led to internal criticisms aimed at preserving the magical community's boundaries. I argue that these responses, these magical responses, arose as a result of a crisis of presence, that feeling of lack of agency that emerges when something is very high stakes uh, and also we don't have much control over it. And uh, I analyze the magic resistance as performative and aesthetic as well as political. And what drew you to studying the magic resistance? And you also, in your article, discuss the reaction to it among other Wiccans and pagans. Right. So I've been studying modern pagan witchcraft and other forms of modern paganism since the early 1990s. And I maintain pretty close ties with these communities. A lot of these communities are heavily online, so I don't need to travel or, uh, you know, or go to an exotic place to maintain uh, strong connections with my field communities. Mm -hmm. um, around 2016, early 2017, I began to see their responses to the election. Uh, and I decided that they were worth exploring further. Um, I've also written about politics and expressive culture in other contexts and have a deep-seated interest in the study of oppositionality and resistance movements from Gramsci to the 1960s counterculture and beyond. And I've argued in other works of mine that modern pagan witchcraft is a countercultural oppositional movement that pushes back against mainstream culture. So this is really an extension of other interests that I have had and have written about throughout my career. Great. And were you surprised by anything that you found um, during while you were doing your research on the magic resistance? Two things really jumped out at me. The first was the way the magic resistance jumped beyond the boundaries of the magical and pagan communities and inspired non-affiliated people to participate. Um, many people know about my study interests, my research interests. And in the days following Michael Hughes' first post on Medium in February 2017, at least a dozen non-pagan people contacted me asking me how they could participate in the Trump binding spell, whether it was safe for them to do magic, what I knew about it. So these were not people who identified as witches and pagans. They were ordinary individuals. Sometimes they were colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the way that that spell just jumped the boundaries of the magical community really surprised me. And that's significant because, as I said, these were not witchy types. Another noteworthy thing I became aware of through this study was the prevalence of apocalyptic narratives among modern pagans and witches. And these came to the fore as a response to the magic resistance, people saying, hey, we don't have to bind Trump. Um, the falling apart of the American empire is really part of some larger plan. Uh, it's part of a coming apocalypse that is going to reorganize things and allow a new set of values our values, meaning the values of the pagans and witches, to come to the fore. They had been presently pre, uh, present previously in the culture, but this political change really brought them forward. Thanks. That's very interesting. What are some of the big picture conclusions that you've drawn from your study of the magic resistance? I think the big takeaways are that when the stakes are high and we feel a lack of control or agency, we as human beings naturally turn to magic. Now, magic has been called a weapon of the weak by, for example, James C. Scott, the anthropologist, uh, in that it's typically used by those who are not in power. In the Trump presidency, the witch, kind of the symbol of the magic resistance, has become a symbol of everything that is excluded and marginalized by the administration women, vulnerable populations, uh, the environment, uh, other than human beings. Uh, and so the witch has become both a representation of and a key actor in resistance magic. Interesting. And are there any updates 
uh, currently here in um, May 2020. Are there any developments, new developments? We're in the dark moon, and that's when the uh, the magic resistance, Michael Hughes' magic resistance, uh, work their spell to bind Trump, and it's still going strong. In fact, I would say it's even stronger right now in the time of COVID, when so many people are sheltering at home, they're feeling anxious, they feel a need for community. And so the online community that was created as a result of the bind Trump spell is sustaining for many participants. They've developed friendships that go beyond the Facebook group and that are helping them cope with this isolation, this anxiety, and the frustration at the Trump administration's shockingly inadequate response to the pandemic. And of course, in such high stakes situations, uh, as a global pandemic, this inevitably leads to anxiety and it's resulting in the emergence of more magical practice. For example, a whole bunch of magical practices aimed at protecting people's health, uh, keeping away, keeping the virus out of their homes and so forth. When you add to this the looming 2020 election, you get the perfect crucible for heightened magical responses. So there's a lot of magic going on right now. Fascinating. And what are you working on now? Well, I have several projects on the stove, if you will. I'm working on an article about those pagan apocalyptic narratives that emerged through my research on magic and the 2016 election. Uh, so that's one thing. I'm also looking at how modern pagan religions, including Wicca, are responding to the restrictions preventing them from meeting face to face during the COVID pandemic. Um, these are very experience-based religions. How are they adapting their very embodied ritual practices to an online environment? And finally, I have a bigger project cooking on the back of the stove that looks at nature and the spiritual imagination at a time of global climate crisis. How do we imagine nature? How do we imagine natural forces, animals, and other than human forms in ways that help us reconnect to a threatened planet? Thank you very much for talking with me. Well, it's been a pleasure, Catherine, and it's, it's especially been a pleasure working with you as the editor of Nova Religio. We had some ups and downs, as all edited uh, special issues do, but you have been uh, sustaining and supporting throughout, and without you, we could not have had this issue, so thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, it, I thought it went very smoothly, and it was a pleasure to work with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.